Okay. This webinar today is about the top 10 reasons attorneys trained in big New York firms tend to command the most respect in the market. It's actually a very important webinar. It's important if you're, even if you're not in New York, but if you are in New York, it's really important to understand the dynamic of New York trained attorneys because you'll be coming up with the, against them regardless of your practice area at different types, different times in your career. And it's, un, it's important to understand how they think and how the law firms think. It's also important to understand um, what happens further along you get in your career and the more sophisticated types of firms you get into. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I think it's a great webinar, just or the topic of it, just because you can really learn a lot, whether you're a law student, you're already an attorney in a big firm and thinking about leaving, whether or not you're trying to go to a bigger firm and what the consequences are if you leave large law firms. So I'm going to talk about that. And then typically what I do after the webinars is I'll take questions and I'll take as many questions as everyone has today that I have no time limitation or anything. So I should be able to get to all the questions. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the legal market right now. Uh, I've been through several recessions in the legal market, starting with the first one, which was in it was late 2000. And then other ones, obviously, you had 2000. And 11 was one, and then you had 2008, and so there's, or 2018, 17, 19, and now I think that we're going into a pretty serious recession in the legal market. There's been lots of layoffs and deferments already of first-year classes, and from what I can see, things are going to get worse, and they're going to get worse in certain markets. Because I've been doing this for so long, and I've run so many businesses in the legal space related to legal careers, I can provide you today what I think are the best options for uh, responding to this recession and the legal market and uh, really what you can do because every attorney actually is safe uh, if you take the right moves, but most people don't take the right moves. And it's when the stock market's high, everyone thinks it's going to keep going higher and higher. And then when it slows down, they think, oh, it's just a blip. And then it keeps going down, it keeps going down. And then eventually, and people don't pay attention to that. And that's how people lose a lot of money. That's the same thing with their legal career. So I'm going to warn you today about some of the things to look for as well. In terms of New York firms, the best New York firms really have a, a lot of mystique and they command a very high regard from other firms, attorneys, legal clients, and the market generally. When I was a attorney, of, when I was clerking for a federal judge in Michigan, I remember that we had, we had a case that was a class action and there were lots and lots of law firms and people involved. And, and then one of the attorneys announced that there was someone there from Sherman and Sterling or one of these kind of really prestigious firms. And that attorney was actually like a first year or second year. And I remember everyone in the, the, this big group of attorneys was just very impressed. And a lot of these big firms do carry a lot of clout. And I'm going to tell you why that is. And the attorneys from them do. And it's based on a lot of factors that I'll get into today. Uh, but there's really no single reason why a lot of people consider New York firms the best. But there's a lot of them. I was reading recently a biography of Michael Dell. And I don't know what he was doing. He was taking the company public or doing merging or something. All he talked about was using Wachtell and, I don't know, just very, very prestigious firms in New York. And instead of firms that were in his home state or in Austin and around at that or Houston. And so people tend to go to the, these firms when they have very big issues and New York firms tend to do that kind of work. And so you need to understand why that is. And uh, in these firms and the attorneys that come out of them are, frankly, in the market, often considered the best, the most highly trained and the most competent attorneys in the country. And, and it's just a fact. And, and if you want the, the skills to be at the top of the legal profession, there's lots of good places to do, but there's really no place that is consistently better than New York. This started rubbing off on me when I was after the, the first big financial crisis in my career, which was in two, that late 2000. And as people came back from these kind of the, a lot of the companies that had crashed, which at that time were a lot of startups because everyone thought the internet was going to take over and Everyone threw money at these internet companies and there were public offerings and mergers and, and lots of stuff that was happening. But after that happened, they looked at a lot of the things that had been done and the deals. And the consensus was that most of the deals had been done by firms in Silicon Valley and there were problems with them and they, a lot of the work was sloppy. But the firms that the work that had been done in New York and all these new companies uh, was held up a lot better. And so I heard that a lot. And I'm not, obviously, I don't have any problem with Silicon Valley law firms. But at that time, this is what the word on the street was about the work and the different quality of work that had been done by firms in different markets. And it still holds true today. There's just a level of prestige that attorneys from a lot of these firms have. 
that's not dissimilar from the prestige of having attended an Ivy League law school. If you work at Paul Weiss or you work at Cravath or you work at one of these firms, it, it does define you for the rest of your career a lot of times. And people they'll talk about it, they mention it in the same way that attorneys that work at, worked at or went gone to a good law school or a good college mention it. They take it very seriously. And, and this is often very confusing to attorneys from the South, where everyone talks about different firms down there, like Austin and Bird or Chicago, where people are talking about Sydney and Austin and, and, or Texas, where there's Baker Botts and the West Coast, where there's a lot of big native firms there too. So a lot of people in these markets don't understand it. You could be a, an attorney coming out of a school in Los Angeles and doing very well. And, and really the firms that are on your map are the best firms in California. And, and so people don't often understand the prestige levels of these firms and, and what they mean. And people that do very well at schools like Harvard and, and Columbia are very aware of this packing order and, and why it's important for attorneys. And so I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. When I'm working with equivalent candidates, and I've worked with thousands of attorneys that may be lo relocating to another part of the country from New York, Chicago, or the West Coast, the ones from the top New York firms almost always do better. If someone from New York wants to relocate to Minneapolis, some from uh, San Francisco wants to relocate to Minneapolis, and someone from Chicago wants to relocate to Minneapolis. In almost all cases, they're similar types of attorneys in terms of the strength of their background, but one is coming out of a big New York law firm. Typically, the New York law, New York attorney will not only get more interviews, but will close more interviews and do better in the interviews. And it's not always the case, but it is a lot more the case than, than not. It's just, it's a different person in a lot of respects in terms of the way they think about the practice of law, not being uh, I don't think that's classist or anything along those lines. It's because of the way New York firms tend to operate and the type of work that they do. So the first thing is of the 10 reasons is the prestigious New York law firms that often serve you know, large, very cost diverse clients that really have the option of selecting any firm they want for the legal work. And, and so the attorneys that are associated with these firms and that selectivity of the clients often get what's a halo effect. And there's some things that are important to understand about living and working in New York City. It's a very expensive city to do business in. It's a very expensive city to live in. It's also a very expensive city to work in. And also the taxes are very high. There's city taxes and there's taxes if you live in New Jersey that are high and there's the area is crowded. There's, it's a very difficult place to live. People live in small apartments. Many times people live outside of New York and have long commutes. That it's not easy to raise a family. You, people send kids to private schools, which are very expensive. It's just a very hard place to live and do business. And, and not only that, you have crime and, and just transient people going through there sometimes. And it's just a very difficult place to even practice law. And the other thing is that uh, there's a very high competition for the best legal talent. So uh, the law firms need to pay high salaries to attract it. And the law firms also can be extremely demanding uh, of the types of attorneys that they hire and have all sorts of cutoffs and things that don't always exist in other markets. If an attorney is in Chicago, which is a great legal market, and there's very good firms there, and is laid off and, and wants to find another job, there's a decent chance that another large law firm in Chicago may hire them. But in New York, there's so many attorneys to choose from and so many reasons to eliminate people. Staying employed with a firm is a huge accomplishment. And not only that, but the number of applicants for each job is large. And so the law firms will they'll hire the best person they can get and they'll look for reasons to eliminate people. So it's like grade points and all these sorts of things. It's almost like applying to an Ivy League school in the sense that they're going to select the very best out of very good people applying for the same jobs. Office space is very expensive. That's very expensive in most parts of New York, and it's going down, but it's, it is very expensive. The administrative support is very expensive. So people that do in, in different departments, secretaries and things often make a lot of money, much more than they would in other cities. And all the things that are necessary to run a law firm come at a higher cost than they would in, in other cities for the most part. And so the rates of these law firms typically are very high and need to be to offset all of these costs. And in many New York law firms, the rates of a junior associate are higher than those even of partners in mid-sized firms in smaller cities at good firms. It's that much of a differential. And because of these high costs, these more prestigious firms often typically do work for companies that can afford them and want the very best attorneys they possibly could be. And these are often the largest 
most not cost sensitive client in, in the United States and all over the world. And these giant profitable companies throw off a lot of money um, and they have no issue with spending a lot of money if you're a company generating billions of dollars a year or hundreds of millions. As long as you receive the best possible legal work, you're not necessarily going to be looking for the level of efficiency and lower bills that a smaller company would. So the, this big work and the, where there's a lot of money involved does go to a lot of firms in New York. And most large New York law firms are servicing many of the most successful companies in the country, as well as all over the world. And they're not just doing work for companies in the area. They, they made the all over. And, and they'll get the associates and attorneys that are working there get a halo effect from this because employers and potential clients and others infer that in order to get even get a job in a city where it's extremely competitive to get a job and there's lots of applicants, it's very difficult to stay employed with a lot of firms. If the attorney's accepted in this and allowed to work on these important matters, the presumption is they must be very good. And how does that compare with other markets? Certainly, Los Angeles is a competitive market. Chicago is a competitive market. The Bay Area is a competitive market. But this market is just, it's, there's a difference to it. And, and it's something that people in my industry and other industries very much understand. Uh, and now in top New York firms, <clears throat> excuse me, there's often a culture of kind of paranoia. And this isn't that way for all firms. Certain law firms have a reputation to be more easygoing than others. For example, Simpson Thatcher has always had a reputation of having very smart people, but, but people that were a little bit more mellow and more friendly than other firms. But every firm has a different culture. Uh, but you have to understand that when so much money is going around, there's a very high level of attention to detail and the quality of the work being done. That's just because if you turn in a work something to a client, which will almost all cases have a general counsel and maybe even multiple people in their legal department, if they find simple errors in the work or, or logic errors and citation errors and typos and things, they're going to be very upset. And it's that way for firms in all parts of the country, but it's elevated to a little bit higher level at a lot of firms in New York. And you know, every people that work in these firms are producing work that is very carefully reviewed. It's gone over for consistencies and imperfections. And because there's in many cases, these firms are huge. The work done by a junior associate may be overlooked by a mid-level associate who may have a senior associate look over things, who may have a, even a non-equity partner look at things before. It just goes through a lot of stages that other firms wouldn't do. And because there's just not, the client is often not willing to pay for it, or it's just not part of the DNA of the firm. And this our oversight exists, of course, in all firms. There's very good firms in, in Los Angeles and Chicago, all over you know, the country, but certainly a lot of these New York-based firms do have a reputation for a culture where this stuff is really emphasized a lot. Um, and because of that, because accuracy and, and how you're presenting things to the client and the type of work being done and the extra costs that the client's paying, there's a paranoia that these attorneys have about mistakes, whether they're mistakes that are social in nature, mistakes that are just in terms of the quality of the work they're turning in. There's a heightened level of paranoia in these firms and, and worry that you don't necessarily see in all firms around the country. And, and again, the people are left in fear, even the partners, associates, and others. They believe that they're one mistake away from losing a client or losing their jobs and often conduct themselves as such, meaning they're always on their best. They're trying to really portray an image of being in control of themselves, of the work, of the different things around them. And, and again, the work that's done, as I said earlier, it, it tends to often be just a little bit tighter, a little bit more air-free and more consciously considered from every single angle and aspect because clients can afford that. And that carries over into the type of work that they do. It's very interesting when I'm working with, if I'm working with an attorney from Sullivan and Cromwell or one of these really top firms, they may send me 10 different versions of their resume because they're reworking small things and tightening up language. And I just don't see that as a general rule from any other attorneys I work with in other parts of the country. And it's like that if they're putting together business plans. It's like that when they're researching firms to apply to everything. There's just a tightened level of, of redoing things and making them perfect than, than you may not see in a lot of other people. And the idea is with this kind of perfect work is if an in-house counsel is reviewing something and they find a typo, the in-house counsel may presume that the information contained in the document, the, the, the logic and the need of the work product 
may be riddled with all sorts of mistakes. So this is a lesson to understand for attorneys at all levels. As you move down uh, the pipeline from firms that are serving the biggest clients to firms that are serving individuals and the smallest clients, typically you'll see less attention to detail because there's not the clients aren't willing to pay as much. And so the work comes out many times sloppy, sometimes formatted improperly, many times with run on sentences and all sorts of problems. But you don't see that from attorneys from often the best firms. Now, I'm sure they do uh, make mistakes, but you don't see it as much. And the reason is because uh, the way that uh, attorneys are taught to think in a lot of these big, bigger firms is that if you're making mistakes in your formatting, in your language, you're making typos, you're not creating very perfectly written prose and emails, and then the thought is that, that you're not thinking through uh, the logical conclusions and the way you're presenting information and the way you're thinking about information. So if the work hasn't been, isn't proofed at the, and looked at the you know, upper level, meeting the mechanics of something, then how can you possibly trust the logic that may go into to, to the arguments being made or the, 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 the transaction documents and that sort of thing. And when clients are paying a lot of money for legal work, they really want to be convinced that they're paying for the absolute best service you possibly can. And, um, they want to make sure that they look the best, meaning you're representing them and uh, the opposing counsel is seeing very, very good work on the other side. And, and it's, it's a reflection of the client's brand the quality of work that you do. So if you're out there doing work for a giant company, which could be, I don't know, Owen Mills or something, it doesn't matter. But then that company, if you're not doing a really good job for them, that's reflecting on their brand. And also the brand of the law firm and the law firm, these law firms rigorously protect the brands and in some cases been doing for a hundred or more years. And it's because these attorneys are working with the largest clients, they're often, more often than not, put on very high stakes matter. Matters where they're surrounded by teams of people trying to do the best possible work. So one thing that happens a little bit more often than not with New York firms is they're more likely to get work when it's bet the company type matters or very important transactions than than work in other markets. So a lot of times the work that comes to them is the most important. If a big company, say, I don't know, Herman Miller, in, which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, or General Motors in Detroit. If one of these companies is involved in some very serious lawsuit or very serious transaction, they will often not use firms in Michigan or Chicago, or they will go to the best firm they can find in New York. And, and that's just like the example I told you earlier with Michael Dell. And, and this is just how it works. Even when there's, even sometimes when they have a local office, in a city. So if a New York firm is in, say, Palo Alto, a lot of times they'll not use the Palo Alto office. They may actually want to go to the New York office to represent them, leaving the people in Palo Alto feeling silly. And so this is just how it worked from that same firm. And this is how a lot of people think about this in the market. And, 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 and obviously, this kind of environment will rub off on the attorney that's part of it. And um, and that's one of the reasons that the market seems to respect these attorneys so much. Now, I don't know all the other reasons. I'm just telling you some of the ones that I think, but this is one reason that I believe. And again, my experience is that a lot of the best attorneys all over the world are very paranoid about the details of their, not only their presentation with work, but their entire persona. And and attorneys who are average to poor will often gloss over these details. And as a result, will often lose cases and, and different matters and, and not do as well as, as other people would. And, and they're not working for clients. And because a lot of other firms aren't working for clients willing to spend the money to do the work in this much depth, they'll often try to wing it and, and to, to an extent that a New York firm wouldn't, the best New York firms, and because they may not understand things with the level of depth that is necessary to lead to get the most advantages. Yeah, I'm going to tell a quick story that I think is funny, but it's not. I don't know if it's funny. It's very interesting. When you look, because I live in Los Angeles, it's fun to drive around and you can go to open houses and stuff. And there's houses, one not too far from just sold for a couple hundred million. And it's, it's insane. But it's almost even with the real estate, like the higher up. And I never thought I would ever live in a market where 
um, houses are routinely, routinely $50 million or more. But when you look at the most expensive houses, it's interesting. Often everything is perfect. The architecture is perfect. The, the interior is perfect. The, the appliances, the doors, everything is perfect and well thought out. And as you move down the ladder, a lot of times things aren't as well thought out. If you're trying to make something perfect, you will uh, go to an excruciating detail to make something perfect and you can charge more money for it. And so that's one way that people in the, think about any product, uh, whether it's a lawyer or uh, something you're trying to sell for a lot of money, whether it's a house, whether it's a piece of clothing from a really good store as opposed to something that's mass produced, it, everything is perfect. And a law, as a lawyer, you're a product and you have to realize that your product and the, comes with certain expectations and the brand of the firm comes with certain expectations. And a better brand means that it's going to consistently produce a higher quality of things that you may not think of, but people that are at a very high level are thinking about it. So you buy a really good purse from you know, Hermes or something, and you know that the leather is going to be the best, the sewing of the thing is going to be the best, that the humans and not machines are going to be involved where possible, that the design is going to be the best, I've done by the best designers. And so you, the more detail you put into a product, often the more you can charge for it. And maybe t- maybe the product is even lasts longer and is better. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I said the, the test of time with all these bad transactions that were done in the internet boom, the New York firms often produced a better quality product. And, and they're older, they're 100 years old, a lot of them. But but attorneys from these firms, if they're expected to understand the matters they're working on in great depth, and given the time and money to do, they're really going to develop work habits and become much better attorneys in the long run. So it's not just the fact that they're at these firms that makes them good. It's the habits they learn from other attorneys there. It's the firm's tradition of doing work a certain way, its brand. It's the type of clients it gets that they're willing to spend a lot of money. It's all these things. And the best New York firms also give attorneys the ability to become highly specialized, whereas in other markets, that may not occur. So if you look at a corporate attorney, for example, in Minneapolis, that attorney's resume, and Minneapolis is a great market, so is I don't know, New Orleans. These are lots of legal markets around the country. But a corporate attorney from one of those markets may do M&A, they may do general corporate, Uh, They may also do a little bit of securities and they'll do many different types of corporate. Whereas the typical attorney in New York at the biggest firms is more likely to do M&A and even a subspecialty within M&A and be even more specialized. And most law firms around the country, attorneys in different practice areas are often more generalist in their practice area or just generalist than specialist. But in New York, because the billing rates are much higher than other factors, the attorneys tend to become extremely specialized in their practice area niches. I remember when I was a summer associate in a large New York law firm a long time ago, but they would kind of school us in the way they were different from other firms. And they said stuff like, in our firm, instead of just doing this type of transaction, we have attorneys that have spent their entire careers just concentrating on one aspect of the transaction and one type of uh, one type of contract or something. And I thought that was very interesting, meaning when a client comes to them, they don't just get some generalist that's going to have to spend money doing R&D. They get someone that actually knows their matters in great detail, therefore is more efficient, and therefore the law firm can charge a lot more money. And someone that's very specialized will often understand their practice here in great depth and in such depth that they'd be among the few people in the world with such knowledge. Uh, I, when I started the attorney search and, and th- through what I've done throughout the, the past few decades, all I do are law firm placements. And, and every day I spend hours learning uh, new things about practice areas and how to match attorneys from different firms. And so the more, you, the more depth and the more time you spend doing something and concentrate on it, the better you become by the point where um, there's hardly anybody in the world that's as good as you. I've seen people that I remember seeing a project finance attorney. There's an old firm in New York called Brown and Wood. And he was for 15 years before he got laid off. He'd been doing, again, one little aspect of project finance, which I thought was just amazing. I'd never seen anybody like that. And then when it was time for him to look for a new job, there were only like two firms in the world that even had someone doing that. And he was able to get jobs and interviews of both and jobs at one of them. This type of specialization is not always the case, but in almost all instances, 
at the best New York law firms, a lot of these attorneys do become more specialized than they would be in other sorts of firms. And why is that? It's because the law firms can afford to, they have enough work coming in in these specialties where they can actually afford to have people specialize. It actually gives them more business because with the specialized attorneys. And, and then if a deep pocket attorney has a deep pocket client, has a, 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 law, a matter that calls for a lot of specialization, they would prefer going to a firm where there's specialists in those subspecializations as opposed to non-specialists. I went to college with a, a guy that became a doctor and he specialized in something so, I don't even know what it was. It was something where I think children were born with a head that was too large. I don't, some, something along those type of lines, but a, a very unique genetic condition. And he spent with medical school, then his residency, then he did these postdoctoral, I don't know, fellowships. And so he didn't even start practicing until he was in his 40s because he'd been doing so much study on this. And But when he came out, this operation that he understood how to do, he would basically, anyone in the world that needed it would come to him and he would charge a lot of money, like a quarter million dollars or something because he was such an expert. And this is a lot of times what uh, happens in the legal space. So people become very specialized. So if you had a, I don't know, if you had a certain type of heart condition, you could go to a regular heart doctor, or you could go to a cardiologist, or you could go to a subspecialist within cardiology, and you would probably feel a lot better than using a generalist. So it's like that for the biggest clients. And the New York law firms tend to have a specialist in various areas and that can command much higher prices for the type of work they do. Now, that's not to say that law firms in Los Angeles and the Bay Area and Houston and Dallas and Miami don't have specialists as well, but it's more common in New York law firms and almost more expected. And because the billing rates are so high and the firms have to charge them, the clients of those firms are more willing to pay them when they're sold on having specialists that know exactly what they're doing. The out five hours of a specialist time may be equivalent to 10 or 20 hours of a non-specialist time in that general practice area. So actually the way that a New York firm would present it would be we're saving you money, even though we're charging you so much more because we know what we're doing. And therefore you're even likely to do much better in terms of the result. And if you are specialized, it makes you more, more hireable from the standpoint of a law firm. Because if a law firm is hiring laterally and you're listing all sorts of different things you do on your resume, that's not going to help you as much as it would be if you're very specialized. And if you have unique skills and you won't be competing with a lot of applicants for a job requiring someone with your background. Now, I do want to take a little divergence here and just talk to you a little bit about BCG, but not BCG specifically, but something that we've learned about practice areas and what's so important. So a lot of attorneys, when they submit their resume on BCG, will say things like, I do IP, then I also do some corporate, and I've also got some real estate experience. Thinking that the more type of practice areas you have experience in, the better you will do. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. Most law firms that are hiring laterally, not all, but most, and law firms that use that are hiring business that work for businesses actually prefer specialists. So being getting a lot of experience in different practice areas may you may think helps you, but you're much better off leading with one solid practice area than you are having multiple practice areas on your resume because it makes it look like you're not specialized. And so this is something that every resume should do. Very few do it. Most resumes will talk about all these different types of experience a person has. And that's exactly uh, what most law firms that serve businesses don't want to hear. They want experts. And the more of an expert you are, that means you're going to be more efficient. It means you know what you're doing. It means you're committed. It means you've been learning about that practice area as opposed to someone that has a bunch of practice areas. So when someone's submitting their resume to BCG, you know, the smartest thing they can do is really think about their experience and word it in a way where they look like an expert in one practice area. Maybe they have some experience doing other things. You can certainly mention that in passing, but you want to look like an expert. And very few people do this. We uh, have to review resumes manually and reclassify people. We have a team of, I don't know, that does nothing but this and with rules and all sorts of things. But it's very important that you have a specialized practice here and you know what you're doing because the more practice areas you list on your resume, the worse off you are. The other thing that's interesting is a lot of times people will have had multiple jobs. So they'll have one job where they're doing 
IP. Then the next job, they're doing litigation. Then the next job, they're doing litigation and real estate. And they think it's great to list all this different experience and things they've done. Well, all that shows the firm is that you've been doing all these different things and haven't been really concentrating and learning one practice area. Because the more you learn one practice area, the better you are, the better service you're providing, and the more you look committed. And the more you have multiple practice areas, it's the opposite. It's also that way with practice settings. If you're committed to working in a law firm practice setting, you're learning about a law firm over and over again. But if you're a law firm, you go to the government, you go in a house, and go back to a law firm, it's not that. And this is one thing that you know can hurt you with a law firm. And I can certainly answer questions about this when we get done with this webinar, but it's very important to realize that being a specialist is extremely important, even to the extent that you're a subspecialist within a major practice area. So what does that mean? It means you could be an M&A attorney, but you specialize in merging different hospital groups or so, literally something like that, as opposed to just being a general M&A attorney, or you're a securities attorney and you specialize in doing merging companies into corporate shells and then raising money. There's all sorts of specialties that you could do. And it's very important to, to make sure that you have a specialty. There's another thing I'll tell you that's very interesting. Attorneys that are in practice areas like family law or insurance defense or trust in estates or ERISA, where they're just doing one thing and they've been doing one thing their entire career, get more interviews, get more jobs than people that are doing multiple things. It's always been the case. And so it's very interesting. And all that, it doesn't mean most people think, oh, family law is not prestigious or personal injury is not this prestigious. Actually, it is prestigious because you're likely to be able to get employed your entire career because there's not many people that specialize in things as opposed to doing a lot of different things. So specialization is extremely important to your career. If you just get one thing out of this webinar, um, understanding that and understanding the nature of New York firms, why they can charge more money for specialists is very important. It could change the whole dynamic of your career because the more you learn about something, no, it'll take other people years to catch up with you and you understand how things work you know, much better. And then if you work at a New York firm, there's also a presumption that you work extremely hard and know how to find work to be done. And, and again, everyone knows that attorneys in major New York law firms typically work extremely hard. And the presumption of at law firms in other parts of the country is that if you've worked in one of these law firms, then that you've got, you have a work ethic engaged. I mean, that, the, from being around certain the people in your firm and also just from the nature of those firms where you're going to work extremely hard and you can tolerate long hours. Why do the law firms make people work so hard? It's because a lot of times they're about the company matters, but also they want to generate as much possible money from you as possible because they have high expenses. So uh, they, your salary is even higher. While attorneys work very hard in most major law firms, New York firms definitely have an expectation, but that and almost it's unsaid, it doesn't need to be pointed out that you're going to have to work extremely hard. And there's things like there's really not a lot of tolerance for avoiding responsibility or not working long hours inside of most of these firms. It's just how it is. It's not, you can't get away with not doing so. And, uh, and again, attorneys in all firms and all markets work hard, but in New York, there's definitely an emphasis on it that I think feels a little bit more real uh, to the attorneys there. And it's a lot more about survival because again, there's so many attorneys competing for the same jobs in that market that if someone just takes their foot off the gas, they're very in easy to replace. And, and again, it's definitely expected um, for the attorneys in the largest New York firms. And the other thing that's important for anybody in any profession, but the legal profession especially, is the idea of finding work to be done and keeping your hours as high as possible. So this is a big mistake that a lot of junior associates make. It's also a mistake that people make even to the mid-level range and a lot of firms around the country. So the idea is that if they're not assigning me things to do, then great. I don't have any work to do. So I'm going to go home early or I'm going to play games on the internet. Who knows? But th there's a that idea exists in a lot of places. But when you think about it, really the most important thing for an attorney and associates that are at, at working at a very high level is you tend to be very motivated to find work to be done. So what is finding work to be done? It's figuring out things that you can do and bill uh, when other people will just turn in a project. So it's finding out, it's bonding with partners if you're an associate to, to get work. If you're in a partner, it's bonding with potential clients to get work. Everybody's trying to find work to be done. 
And this is one of the essentials of being an attorney. And very few people understand this. And that's why very few people, a lot of people leave and things. They don't understand what this is about. What it's about is you need to make up and find things and people to give you work. And, uh, and attorneys in New York, if work comes along, they're excited. It makes them feel good. They have lots of projects. They'll stay up. I, I talk to attorneys in New York all the time, and I can tell that they've been up for 48 hours. It's just how it is. And, uh, and the largest New York firms, the partners, also have their choice of who to give work to. They have more than enough people to, to give work to. People are leaving firms all the time and not committed and going to other firms and working laterally. So they'll, they're going to choose the associates to do the best job, that work the hardest and build the most hours. Not always. Sometimes they're looking for efficiency but and do the best work and return in the best work they don't have to worry about. And, and again, most attorneys in New York firms in other markets too, but it seems a little bit more exaggerated in New York, are concerned about keeping their hours up and can really compete with each other to get access to work. Who are you working for? Who's giving you work? How do you get more work? It's not the, the and the people that kind of have a problem are the ones that sit around waiting for work to come to them. And it's a good system if you think about it, because what is it doing? It's training attorneys to do what they would have to do if they were partners, which is go out and impress clients and get work. And it's the hungriest attorneys who do the best, tend to get the most work, the ones that want the most work, the ones that are enthusiastic about work, the ones that are happy and thank people for giving them work and the ones that you know, do more than is expected of them when they do work and make it easy to work with and don't ask a lot of questions that take up time and figure things out. These are all very important. And if, you, if you're not hungry and don't get work, then you're simply going to lose your job by not having built enough hours. I remember I had one candidate that was working in a big New York firm and, and the assignments were sent out, I don't know, every Monday morning. And the first person to get him to grab the assignment would get the job. And so everyone sat in front of their computer by 8 a.m. in order to get work. And this guy was like, I'm not going to participate in this. This is demeaning. Like, why would I do that? And, and so he eventually, after three or four months of doing that, lost his job. And he was in New York. His family was in New York. He'd gone to Columbia or something and uh, didn't want to move. And no one would hire him just because he'd lost his job. And, and that's scary. And uh, that's what happens. And the, the, you have to compete uh, to get work in all areas of the country, of course. But in New York, you really are competing with a lot of people to get work. Now, you may have a much easier time getting work in different economies. And so when it's a good economy, you may just be given work no matter what, but everything always slows down. So during those times when things are busy, um, you really need to work as hard as you can, but you also need to impress people with the quality of your work. And uh, but the ability to generate work uh, is extremely important, meaning you need to be able to come up with extra work that can be done and, and suggested to partners or suggested to the clients if you have contact with the clients. You need to do the work as thoroughly as possible. And, and what is creating work to be done? It's something like maybe you write a four-page letter to the client about something instead of just turning it in and you rewrite it and you rewrite it and you rewrite it, uh, billing lots and lots of hours to make it as good as possible. This is the way things go. When I was, I was working and my second job was a a large New York law firm. And I remember if I would write a letter or something to a client about a legal issue, and I might finish the letter at, might take, I might start at 9 a.m. and finish at two or three in the afternoon. But then I would be in the office till midnight, rewriting and reworking and making that was perfect. And that was what was expected. And it's not to say that was, I'd have to do that my whole career. But as a young attorney, I had to force myself to put details on I normally wouldn't have in a first or second draft. And then again, one of the things about New York that's very interesting is that if you work there, there's really a presumption that your life and focus is around your job. And, and most attorneys in New York, they, don't, they certainly do, but there's not a lot of emphasis on work-life balance. I've seen some New York law firms, not all of them, that may have less of this than others. But honestly, your identity often in the large New York law firms come from who you work for and, and often... The, there's a presumption that you understand and respect the importance of hard work. I remember working in New York and there would always be a line of cars starting at nine or 10 outside the firm because you would take a car service home when you work like very late at night. And, and it's very interesting and you could take a car for free, but that you were expected to work late and then they send you in a car home, but you're expected, everyone was expected to work late. 
So you have to understand the important talents of work, this work. And then there's a lot of firms on the West Coast, now in the Midwest and other parts of the country. There's an emphasis on working at home. That certainly happened during COVID in New York, where, you know, it, you know, but the people are gradually moving to having a more of an emphasis on working at home and society is changing and, and there's a lot going on. But the undercurrent of the law firms is still working as hard as you can and taking your jobs as seriously as you can and and really following the lead of what the firm wants as opposed to what you want. And, and you're really expected to have kind of an all-in attitude about your job and take it very seriously. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't exist in other markets. And part of what I'm trying to communicate today is that these are things that you can do in any size firm, but understanding that these are important ways to act and behave and think about your job is very important. Being good at your job is, frankly, and the, the expectation is it's more important than sleeping, eating, exercising, personal, your personal life, and more. And in some firms like Wachtell, they have people that will go pick up your prescriptions. They'll, they'll make sure they get your dry cleaning. Whatever you need to keep you working, they will do for you, which is nice. But at the same time, it's more valuable to have you in the office and going out and picking up a prescription or doing something like that. Um, and if, if you don't have that level of dedication, they'll just find someone who will. They'll, you'll get harsh reviews. Maybe they won't say commitment, but they'll say other things. And, and, and it, it does, and a lot of the best firms really exceed what's expected elsewhere. And it's just how it is. And, and what happens in New York more so many times than other areas is this is also very interesting. So someone coming from a very prestigious New York law firm that is, has lost their job or left their job and then wants to go back in the market, won't, this happens quite a bit, rather than go to a less prestigious firm, because they define themselves so much on being in this prestigious firm, will not go back to practice at all. I started seeing this years ago, and I didn't really understand what was going on. But then I thought, wow, these people are, don't want to basically go to a less prestigious firm because they define themselves so much based on the firm they're at. So instead of doing that, they'll go in-house, or which is respected by firms, and or they will give up the practice of law entirely, sometimes just because they associate walking on pins and needles and hours and this level of detail and how difficult it is and the all-consuming nature with the practice of law when it couldn't be further from the truth in a lot of smaller markets and firms, but this is how they think about it. And so often these attorneys will conclude that every law firm must be that way and, and they want nothing to do with it because they want a semblance of a life outside of a law firm. And, and again, when you're working around people that are very highly motivated, and you're a competitive person, also highly motivated, it can be very off-pitting and it can drive many attorneys away from the law because you think this is what it is and, and I don't want anything to do with the practice of law again. I want to do something else. I want to, I want to become a yoga teacher or whatever. And but instead of realizing that this experience you had is not really normal for, the, for being an attorney. The other thing about New York is it tends to be very concentrated. The, there's anyway, you're closer to home usually, but not always. And so you expect to be in the office more. There's also a presumption that if you're a very good attorney, that you're a very good attorney, if you survive in one of these firms, at least five years, if you can last more than five years in any one of these firms, the market's going to believe you're a very good attorney and you will get um, a lot of interest. When I work with attorneys from the best firms and moving firms laterally in New York, and they have someone that's really strong, it's been in for five years, they get a lot of interest from other New York law firms when it could just be crickets if the person is moving around to firms. So being able to be stable in even one New York law firm really says a lot. And it, to such an extent that, that law firms will even call and be curious like if the person doesn't interview with them or where did they go? Because it, it's a reflection. I, there's just a lot going on. And very few attorneys survive a long time in, in the largest firms, especially in one firm. They tend to get psyched out because attorneys are working with are very competitive and will um, psych them out with rumors or working harder, or looking like they're busy. Who knows? But they get psyched out. The hours can psych them out. Sometimes the reviews are very harsh, especially for young attorneys. The way reviews tend to work in the largest firms is when the market is very good, the attorneys will not get very bad reviews. They'll get good reviews. When the market slows down, the reviews start getting bad you're more likely to get a good review or bad review in your first few years of practice because they're trying to make you more paranoid and a better attorney. And then when you become profitable, like your third and fourth year, you start getting great reviews because they're making a lot of money from you. It doesn't require, they don't, you don't require a lot of handholding. 
and you'll get great reviews. And then at some point, when you get more senior and you're closer to being a partner, you'll start getting bad reviews again and become paranoid again, at which point you start working even harder. And then you either make it or you don't. But there's just a lot going on in these firms. And this is going on in all firms. It just tends to be a little bit exacerbated in New York. They, people don't like the hours. The reviews can be a turnoff. The, the competitive nature of your peers and how competitive they are with you and each other, the feeling that you can't keep up with them. There's people billing 3,000 hours a year. And what, how are you supposed to even come close to that? Peers are paranoid. People will say, oh, I'm getting better work than you. People will tell you you made a bad mistake and you have, now it's hurt your brand. Uh, the partners are demanding. The commitment is massive. So if you go home at nine and everyone's there till 11 or 12, how does that look? How does it make you feel? Everyone knows you're leaving. The level of detail required, people get very upset about small errors. I was actually working on an article uh, over the weekend, and it was about interviewing with a New York firm. And I was in my, it was a callback interview. And I was in the final, inter- one of the final interviews of the day. And, it was, and, and I was, I'd come back from lunch and I was interviewing with a couple of people. And I think it was one of the last interviews. And, and I was interviewing with this guy. And it was actually funny. He had a book on, behind him called Principles of, I don't know, you know, basically butt medicine, volume three or something. It was like the size of a phone book. And so I kept looking. I'm like, is this for real? And he was very serious. And, and at some point, he was looking at my resume. And he said, didn't you, you know, were you it's law school? He said, don't they graduate? You don't you graduate in May from University of Virginia Law School? My brother went there or something. And I said, yeah. And he said, how come your resume says June? And I was like, oh, I must have made a mistake. And his face grimaced up and he looked visibly upset. This was a really horrible thing. He got up and excused himself. And then someone came back from the recruiting coordinator. And so thanks a lot. He had to go do something and you'll hear from us soon. And then getting that job had been recommended by a recruiter. And, and so the recruiter, I called him and told him what happened. He's like, oh my God. He's like, I'm going to call them and tell them that it was my mistake or something that I retyped your resume. And, and then in a, I eventually got an offer from the firm after, but it was just, it was very funny. And so this kind of detail is people take this very seriously. Um, and a lot of times clients and a lot of these big firms are very negative. The, the peers are very negative with each other. They're all trying to go in house or they're, they're upset. They don't like the hours. And then you're seeing people leave all the time. And that, that can be demotivating. You feel like, why am I leaving? Why aren't I going in house? Sitting alone in front of a computer for 12 to 15 hours or more per day can be very alienating. People do need to have contact with others that aren't necessarily adverse to them. So that can be very hard. Again, psychologically, it can be very difficult. It was interesting. I was reading a study a few days ago, and it was about when you put rats, when, about getting rats addicted to opium or something, or I don't know what, whatever it's called, the Oxycontin and that sort of thing. And what they were saying is that when if you put a rat in a cage and it's alone, and uh, then it starts getting very anxious. And if you give it the choice between and go, going crazy, and if you give it the choice between water and opiates, it will always go to the opiates and will start abusing it till it gets to the point where it's basically hooked and a major junkie and having all these problems. If you put the same rat, if you put and if you put rats in a in a cage where they're all together, and you put opium out with water, they will prefer the water. Even when they try the opium and get high, they'll just basically go back to the water. And then if you take the addicted rat from the, the one that was working alone and you put them in the in the cage with with the other rat, with the other rats, they'll actually wean themselves off the opiates and start drinking water again. So what does that say? What it says is that I guess the people are more susceptible to addiction and problems and psychological stress when they're doing things alone than with when they're feeling isolated than when they're with other groups of people. And maybe that lesson of rats applies to humans because, you know, what happens when someone's addicted to alcohol or drugs, they send them to Al-Anon or whatever it is, AA, and, and they're around other people. And being around other people makes a sense of connection. And so anyway, and then presumably it helps them get off these substances. So this stuff that an attorney goes through in these large firms, and in New York especially, it really says a lot. And if you can survive all this, there's a presumption that you've gone through the same type of training and had the same experience if you work in a large law firm. And therefore, you can survive anywhere where the environment's less hostile and demanding. And there's a lot less tolerance many times because there's the work is so high stakes for cutting corners or not doing things as well as you can. 
and uh, and any weakness you have. And this exists, of course, in the best law firms all over the country, but you can be more sure that these weaknesses will be exposed. And if you want to hold on to your job, you need to really be careful to fixing these weaknesses and you have to know what they are. And so having spent five or more years addressing your weaknesses, becoming versed in a specialty and billing lots of hours and continually improving and makes you very formidable compared to your peers in other markets. And when you feel more in control, you feel like you put in more and you're entitled to more respect. And this is what happens. So when New York attorneys come up against attorneys in, from other cities, even if it's LA, they have this attitude that they're more in control and more and, and just rubs off. Ask an attorney in any market. And then the other thing is that there's a presumption if you if you went to work in one of these firms, you're just unbelievably motivated. These attorneys that go to these firms know what they're getting into. Attorneys that compared to other markets, they know the hours are going to be brutal. They know um, that they're up against almost impossible odds to make a partner, and but they're up for the challenge. And despite all this, they still go to work in these big firms. And, and the uh, people that are hiring these attorneys in other cities know that if the attorney has survived in one of these and even chosen to go to one of these firms, they are obviously highly motivated and, and because they showed up in the large firm and remained there. And so this meta- motivation is something that really will serve the attorney for the rest of their career. And that's why when you meet attorneys, they say, oh, I started my career at Skadden or whatever. They really take it seriously. And and again, if you're trying to work in, in New York and that's your priority, you're often, you're really trying to push yourself to the most challenging conditions possible and in an area where there's going to be a lot of people that are better than you, that are going to be trying harder than you. And so the level of competition is much higher. It's like the major leagues as opposed to something else. So you need to be really on top. And this is certainly the case at lots of law firms at other cities of the country. You can't criticize O'Melveny in Los Angeles or Gibson Dunn in Washington, D.C. or any of these firms because they're exceptional and they're just as good. But across the board, if not better, this is the what uh, comes up. There's also a presumption for a lot of the firms, people coming from New York, that they're more professional. The culture is much more professional than the West Coast and other parts of the country. So if I'm talking to someone like in the recruiting department of a firm in LA or San Francisco, I'll be saying, how's it going? What are you up to? And you can tell them what you're doing. It could be sound silly. Um, and they'll laugh and you have a good time. If you do that with a person in the recruiting department of a New York law firm, they're very professional and they'll say, that's inappropriate to ask me that. And it's just a different type of culture that's more professional. The dress is more professional. The the, the presentation is more professional. People look crisp and, and put together. Not all the time, of course, but they, they're more. people are more likely to look very polished. They're going to think about their tie and if it's an Hermes tie. I mean, the, there's just a lot how the, their clothes look or their tail. There's just a lot that goes into it that you don't necessarily see in, in other markets. And you may see it in other markets, but it's more emphasized in New York because people pay more attention to it. And, and they're, they're trained to look and act the part more so than attorneys in other cities. I remember when I was a summer associate, this mid-level associate was lecturing me and he was telling me that the I don't know, attorney that billed the highest hours or something or had the most business. So when he walks into a room to, with a client, the, he needs to look like more put together than the client or anyone else in the room to justify his high billing rates. And and again, that's how we thought. So they, you know, the shoes would be polished, their suits would be perfectly pressed. And, and that was a what that firm stood for back then. This is certainly a long time ago and people are more casual now, but there's just a better, there's people are more conscious of how they dress, how they're groomed and more professional because this is how the attorneys, other attorneys around them are. Why is that? It's probably because when they meet with clients, they have to look that way or it's just the culture of the firm. And, and this is probably maybe because they're representing banks and other people in financial sectors. I don't know. And it's been, it's definitely changed in New York. So it's not the same as it was in that respect, but it's still there. And and when New York attorney shows up to an interview in another city, they're can they show up and they're very professional. They're it's just different, and they know to say the right things, and they're not casual, and they they smile when they're supposed to, and they just act different and or differently. And and so employers like this professionalism because they want the people representing them in the market to look and act professionally and present a good image for. The employer and uh, and and again, it's uh, sending a highly pro- polished and professional attorney into a meeting with a client is much preferable. The opposite. I remember I had this candidate once, even in LA, 
he decided to grow, he was at Wild Gotcho, I think, doing IP litigation. Wild's an awesome firm. And, and he had hair that was going down to his buttocks. And I don't know, he'd grown it while he was practicing. And then even in now, even in California, like this guy would go into interviews and no one would hire him. And, but in New York, I can't even imagine. And there's just a level of, in that Wild's a New York firm, by the way, but it was in their Bay Area office. But there's just a level of professionalism in these attorneys that's presumed to care, that they carry that a lot of times attorneys in other markets do and that don't. And then, and it's not to say that attorneys in other markets aren't professional. It's just that as a general rule, you're going to get more professionalism in the culture of New York firms than you may in others other markets. And then the jobs in most New York firms are very difficult to get. There's so many attorneys in New York. And each time there's a job, what happens in New York is a lot of these recruiters subscribe to list where the second a job comes up on a law firm's website or something, it's emailed out to all the recruiters and all the recruiters drop everything and start calling every associate they can in the city. So if there's a job in New York, that, that doesn't happen in LA, that doesn't happen in San Francisco, it doesn't happen in Chicago. But if there's a job in New York, people will, the law firms will get every qualified candidate, whether it's through recruiters or people applying and referrals. There's just so many people competing for the same jobs who have the backgrounds that the law firm is seeking. And the law firms can afford to be extremely choosy when they're hiring. They're going to have, they're going to get uh, just from recruiters, they're going to have the option to hire every qualified candidate that they want. And therefore, they can typically hire the very best attorneys. And uh, in other areas of the country, a law firm won't have that type of, they won't have recruiters calling every matching attorney in the city, but they won't have the same type of selection. And, uh, and the attorney may have good qualifications, and but not the perfect position, but they are hired anyway by the firms. And so firms will make exceptions, though they just more so than they would in New York. And they the New York firms just don't need to take this risk. So things like having employment stability, being employed, your law school, like all these things they can afford to, to look at in a lot more depth than they might in other markets. And in most prestigious law firms, I mean, they'll even hire from all over the country if they find the best person. They can hire based on your personality. They can hire on your qualifications, your fit, your motivation, all sorts of other characteristics that wouldn't even come into to play in a lot of other areas of the country. And, and they are very uncompromising when it comes to hiring them, their hiring standards because they can afford to be that way. Firms like Sullivan and Cromwell, Wachtell, Cravath rarely hire laterally because not only do they want, they, they want to hire lateral people that are going to be the absolute best, and they, they want to hire uh, new attorneys coming in that are likely to, to be the absolute best, and they want to train them in their culture. And, and so that's something that law firms in other cities understand. And as a general rule, these law firms, the people that come out of them interview even better. And, and then uh, it's not uncommon for attorneys trained in this kind of for every firm they interview in another market. They're always the first choice of the employers. So you rarely see this thing from attorneys from California, Chicago, or Texas who relocate to New York. Okay. So the next thing is that attorneys that, that are from New York tend to be much more concerned with prestige and what other attorneys think of them and really want to be among the best. And most law firms that are interviewing New York attorneys in New York are going to be very concerned with prestige, more so, I think, than attorneys in most other cities. It's very common for the best law firms in, in Palo Alto and in San Francisco and LA and Chicago to hire people that are trying to move up. But uh, in New York, when you take your job so seriously and so motivated and billing so many hours, the attorneys really want the most prestigious prestige possible. They're all, almost always going to take a job of the most prestigious firm as opposed to the less prestigious firm. And there's just a lot of, there's a huge pecking order among the firms in terms of the ones that people even consider when they're moving. You have different bands of firms, your most prestigious firms, which are your Paul Weiss's and Simpson Thatcher's and firms with the Scaddens and things along those lines are people are much from those types of firms would be probably not want to go down to firms that are less prestigious and they will, but not always. And so there's just a very kind of unspoken level of prestige and attorneys take it very seriously. And they're very motivated to work at the most prestigious firms because if you're taking your job, if your job is your life, you really want in your, in your brand and you define yourself in this way, it's actually much more prevalent, I think, in firms in New York than from other cities. The attorneys from the best law firms will ask and other attorneys where they're at. And there's if they're at a more prestigious firm, there's people who are very conscious of it. I don't necessarily see that as much in other cities because I, I don't think people take it as seriously. But again, it's something 
but it's, it's, I think is very prevalent. And then this desire to be with the most high, highest performing, the most prestigious firms is channeled into more hours and higher quality work. And so attorneys, of course, are concerned with the paycheck, but the New York attorney tends to be much more concerned about the prestige level of their firm. And, and the entire system really functions based on people trying to be at the, these most prestigious firms and concerned about who their peers are, I think more so than a lot of other markets. It's just something that, that I notice a lot. Attorneys are also surrounded by a culture, emphasizes getting ahead, that's very conscious of its brand and, and working at the best firm. And this really produces a very success conscious attorney, the law firms. Again, the upper end of the legal market creates an attorney more likely than not it has an exaggerated example of what it takes to be good. And again, if you can make it anywhere, it's a reality there. I think a lot of it has to do with the concentration of people and the specialization of the firms. And then the fact that uh, the best work always goes there or often goes there. And, and again, there's a lot of benefits to having started your career in these firms. So to moving to New York, which people do, you can move to firms there and then also to being exposed to it. But most people that are watching this webinar are not going to be working in big New York firms. So, so it's, what's important to understand is the psychology of that and bringing that to your, to your practice. And so what do I mean by that? The emphasis on getting work, the emphasis on professionalism, the emphasis on working long hours, the emphasis on impressing people and billing the most hours, all these things are part of the legal profession. They're just emphasized a little bit more in New York because of the concentration of people, the importance of the clients, the, the, the competition for jobs. They're very emphasized there where they might not be in other markets. And so you can learn from that. So anybody that follows these habits, which are uh, really something that all law firms like, is likely to do very well. And, and so you need to understand what I've talked about today. If you do understand it, and this is interesting to you, then you're probably going to be an exceptional attorney because you understand all these things. And again, you don't have to be in a New York firm uh, to understand this, but you need to understand really um, the importance of all this, Heart, being hardworking, being professional, being motivated, being more committed than your peers, doing that, your work in more detail, getting lots of work and being not tolerating mediocrity. And, uh, and so a career, I think, most of the stereotypes of people coming out of New York firms are largely true. I think that this respect that a lot of people in other markets treat attorneys from, I think is from New York, is to a great extent deserved and, and I think important. I'm going to take questions. I'm going to take a quick break just for a minute or two, and then I'll take questions. I'm also going to talk a little bit about, like I said earlier, the kind of what's going on in the legal market and in terms of the slowdown of work and what you can do about it. And, and really, again, just understanding that can be very helpful. And, and then I'll answer any questions anyone has after a short break. First thing before I go to the questions that I wanted to cover is a little bit about the legal market. And hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit right now is a recession in the legal market and what to do when there is a recession. And, and I think there is a recession right now. So I want to talk a little bit about that and how to deal with it, because I think a lot of people are going through that right now. I just read, I think, Oric yesterday laid off a bunch of people and deferred classes. And, and Oric's a great firm, but they're facing the same sort of issues that a lot of firms are facing. There's In every type of legal recession, what happens first is the Corporate-related work slows down. There's less deal activity because essentially because prices are down and pe people are companies are down and that people are just spending not as enthusiastic to bring new companies to market or to do mergers and things and that tends to slow down the market. But then also as companies run through money, they they have less money to spend on legal services and things like that. So there's the collapse of things like Silicon Valley Bank and. First Republic was largely driven by a couple of things, but one of the things that drove it was there were companies had large deposits of money in in banks and and were drawing down upon those deposits that were the banks were paying very low interest rates on because they don't, weren't bringing in as much cash. And so as that money was came out, the they had less money, they had higher lower interest, they had loans that that were on their books that were at low interest rates and it would cost the banks more money to get anyway it's a long story it's not i don't need to go into a lot of detail but the point is that 
these bank fi- failures that have happened are a sign that there's something that there's a lot of financial pressure on companies, and the companies are obviously going to spend less money. And now you have real estate and other things slowing down. So what? It, so all that means for you is a lot of different things. But what do you do in a recession? If you are if you are a law student or a practicing attorney or in a in a, a law student practicing attorney or in in a disfavored or in a disfavored practice area, which is typically going to be corporate and things like that, what do you do? And what do you which corporate, et cetera? So what do you do? And why is that scary? So it's actually the result the what you do is actually not that difficult, but it's something that a lot of people don't do. So all it means when there's a recession is that typically the ones that are going to get hit, the people that are going to hit the hardest are the law firms with the highest cost. And so that's often going to mean the largest law firms that have the most people in different practice areas when the economy is good. So the law firms with the largest co- the highest cost will often be the ones that are the first to lay people off. And that's how it always is. It doesn't mean that large law firms are bad. There's anything essentially wrong with them. All law firms have go through business cycles. It just means that they have higher costs, which are too many associates, many times too many partners that are not bringing in business. And so law firms with high cost let people go. And and that's just, it's how it always works. And and no one is really safe. If you're a non-equity partner and you don't have work, during a good economy, you may be fine, but during a slower economy, you're going to be in bad shape. So law firms with the highest cost are the most vulnerable. Also, law firms that tend to do, law firms that are heavily weighted towards corporate are the most vulnerable. And so that often means law firms in New York, law firms in Silicon Valley, and those types of law firms are often the most vulnerable. So if you're with one of those firms and and you're wondering what's going to happen, if it's a large law firm, it's dangerous. If it's a law firm that's heavily relied on corporate, that's going to be dangerous. So your New York law firms tend to be your corporate firms, mm-hmm. the corporate markets, the strongest corporate markets are traditionally New York and then Silicon Valley, San Francisco. So this is where most of the activity, at least over the past several years, has been going on. And these are typically the first law firms to let people go when the economy gets bad. And and so that's something to be aware of. Let me just see what's up. (sighs) Sorry. And then corporate Silicon Valley and San Francisco tend to be the these are tend to be the most vulnerable. In other markets, Los Angeles and, and for example, San Diego, law firms actually tend to be more weighted and Washington DC is another one, tend to be more weighted to litigation and things like that. And so those law firms are being more weighted somewhere it's down weighted towards litigation. Firms that do a lot of litigation typically are the less, least vulnerable. Surprisingly, litigation often picks up during the recessions because people are suddenly mad about deals that might have, they might not have been as upset about in a good economy and then come back and start filing lawsuits. And, and this is the way that a lot of law firms actually survive during recessions is they start doing a lot of corporate related work. So in a recession, there's a couple of ways to respond. If you are at certain firms, uh, which would be the very best, which would be like Cravath, and they, they never lay people off. So these are the very best firm. You're probably safe. But at other ones, you're not going to be as safe. But what you do in a recession is you basically, and it's very simple, you just go, you either go to smaller markets, you go to suburbs, and suburbs of major cities, or, or you, you look nationally for, for firm, for, for positions. Okay. So the, the biggest thing is that when it, when the, if you're at a certain size firm, larger firms or corporate heavy firms that are likely to lay people off or to delay starting classes, really the smartest thing you can do is you really want to try to look for positions in smaller markets or suburbs of smaller markets. Because what happens in recessions, a lot of times is some of the corporate, a lot of the corporate work is still being done. And a lot of the, what, regardless of your practice here, is still being done. But the work tends to go to often smaller markets that are less expensive because companies are trying to save money or they go to smaller firms. And there's honestly nothing wrong with moving from a large firm or taking a position at a smaller firm. And then when the recession stops, moving to a bigger firm. I see people all the time 
that have started started at a small firm, and then when the economy improved, and, they, and then they moved to a larger firm later. So you can always do that. But the most important thing, really, in, in any type of recession, is to stay employed. Because if you're not employed and you have any long term period of unemployment, it just looks bad, and it, it makes it much harder. The longer you're unemployed. Uh, the harder it is to get a position. My recommendation to everyone is to really do your absolute best in a recession to to make sure you have a job lined up. It's going to be much di- more difficult in the largest markets because if they're letting a lot of people go at the same time, all those people are going on the market and uh, and you're competing with them. The other thing uh, that's a little bit scary is if you're trying to get a job in a market where there's a lot of layoffs, uh, the law firms will presume that the people that are getting laid off are the ones that are providing the least value to the firm because the law firms often will keep the people that are that have the most long-term value and let the ones go that don't, which unfortunately often means people that didn't go to the best law schools. Like It's very rare for someone from Yale Law School uh, to get laid off and, and don't have the strong background. So if you were lucky to get into a firm, you may be among the first to go. So it's just something to be aware of. And it's a little bit scary. It's, that's how it works. So you need to look at smaller markets. And then you can start off with the suburbs of major cities where you're at. And then you can also look at other markets. And you should look at a lot of markets. You shouldn't just be happy if you're in New York, applying to firms in New York. And you should be looking at the suburbs of New York. You should be looking at Albany and Rochester and Syracuse. You should be, and then you should be looking at smaller markets. It's interesting. There's always things that are that you never really expect that happen in recessions. During the recession of, I don't know, was it 2000 and was it 2018? I don't know. I don't know yeah, whatever. The most the, 2011, I guess. The in the recession back then, like what happened is New York got extremely slow. It was almost like barbaric how bad it got. Then you or 2008, and then and then what else happened? Then you had the Bay Area slow down, but you had these pockets of activity where the corporate and everything was actually improving, which is like Texas, because you had the oil prices were rising. And so these are things you just never would expect. And in Chicago, like the city of Chicago slowed down, but in the suburbs of Chicago, the work picked up. It's very important to look at a lot of markets in a recession. Even if you think I'd never work in one of these markets, you're much better off getting a job than being unemployed. Because when the market picks up, you can always move to a larger market and, and people have a lot more respect for people that may have gone to a smaller firm or a smaller market than people that aren't just don't aren't employed or go in house or something. If you're able to stay employed with a law firm, that really um, is the biggest piece of advice that I can give you. Let me see if I can find something here. I'm trying to open the Q and A. Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. I don't have any questions because it looks like the computer shut down. So if anybody doesn't have, if anybody has any questions, I will try to answer them. But I don't think anybody does because I think everyone got kicked off the webinar. I guess that's it. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry that we had this computer failure, but I will be back next week. I would like, since as we get closer to the the second quarter and into the second quarter, I do like to do a resume review meeting each one once a quarter. Um, I will try to send out reminders for that, and hopefully we can do that next week as well. So thank you. Uh, Or next week, or if not next week, then the following week. 